Today we are going to work with the D&D 5e rule set. We're going to explore the new or newer setting. It's not so new anymore. The Ghost of Saltmarsh. And we're going to be using Fantasy Grounds uh, Virtual uh, Tabletop. And if you guys have not ever um, experienced Fantasy Grounds, it is an awesome program that allows you to play your favorite role-playing games in the privacy of your own home online with people all over the world and lady shell has been uh helping me out and also the other community members in fantasy grounds college have been doing a really good job and helping me uh teach the good word to all the new people and also to engage the community when there's uh no events or anything like that people step up at random so i'm really happy with our community and as a aside, um, today I'm going to show you how I would set up the Salt Marsh campaign for my own personal game. So I'm going to pretend like I've never seen Salt Marsh, and I know this thing has been out for a month or so, and people have already been playing it, and it's been streamed and broadcasted. But one thing they miss out on is there is a ton of third-party material that comes out in tandem with the setting so i'm going to show some of that material that you could potentially use to supplement your campaign whether it be ghost of salt marsh or some kind of oceanic adventure so i'm going to get started here but i wanted to give lady shell a few minutes to say hi 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 <laughs> <laughs> isn't that great um yeah i've I played the Salt Marsh before it came out in May, and um, yeah, I'm not playing it currently, but uh, I was playing it for a while, and it's a lot of fun, and I look forward to what you have to show us here. Okay. So first things first, I'm going to start a new campaign. This is fresh. Clean slate. The only thing I did ahead of time was I made sure my extensions were up to date, which are all these to the right. And Lady Shell and I were talking last night about preparing for this. And I told her I didn't want to do a whole lot of, you know, uh, jumping ahead or, or moving around and doing all that kind of stuff. Because it doesn't help people if I'm already there. But she had suggested that I go and get my tokens ahead of time, so I did do that. And uh, we're going to get started. So right now I have the 5e rule set selected and I clicked on create a new game. And if you're going to plan on hosting anybody as the DM or game master, you got to make sure you hit this run test. And if it says success, then you'll be able to host a campaign usually. If you can't, then you have to work out your network issues. But I'm going to go ahead and just call this Salt Marsh campaign or something like that so that's salt marsh and I'm gonna go ahead and enable some of the um, various extensions that the community has made now if you're pretty new to fantasy grounds I wouldn't recommend uh, using a bunch of these so what I'm gonna do is click on just the few that I need or want to use so definitely want to use the action abilities. I think that's a really cool extension. It may not even come up, but it might. I'm going to use the 5E Critically Awesome Essentials. And Rob Tui and Diablo Bob created that together. And that allows you to transform into different animals and creatures um, as a druid wild shape. Another thing I want to um, enable is this uh, death indicator. So what this does is it basically has a token that appears when one of the NPCs or a player dies. So I'm going to go ahead and load that. And then um, I have a theme here that was made by Shehob and by um, Londell. And I'm going to load that. This is left over from our Founders Day theme. And I'm going to load this uh, Montserrat font, which is made by Matakire. And it makes it easier to see the fonts on your screen. 
And then the next thing is I'm going to load this moon tracker, which is kind of a cool thing. And I'll get into that later. Um, and I think pretty much I'll do the window saver and the GM icon, which are just little features that helps uh, make this uh, running the rule set a lot more convenient. So once I've done all that, I'm going to go ahead and click start. And as that's loading, Lady Shell, do you have any initial thoughts or questions? Um, my one question was when you loaded Medicare's uh, font, did you load the new one or the old one? The new one is font dash Montserrat. I'm pretty the sure this is the new Montserrat. one. Oh. Pretty sure, because I just re-downloaded it just recently. Right, but there, if you have them both on the thing, the old one says Montserrat font big fonts or something like that and the, and the new one is font dash Montserrat because I right. had to ask them that because I had both of them there. Gotcha. Hey, welcome. welcome hey, Windsor. People in our chat. Yeah, we're going to go over a little game prep, a little bit of customization for the uh, salt marsh um, base for the, you know, for the campaign setting. Um, I'm not necessarily going to follow anything by the book. I'm going to set it up I'm going to use some custom assets and I'm going to do those sort of things. Hey, what's going on, Dave? And uh, Jonan and Walking Dude. See you guys out there. All right. So now that this is set up, I'm going to start setting up the table. Now, this is something that I think that uh, most DMs either skip or they don't realize, especially if they're new. And that is to get this desktop in order and in shape so that when you run a campaign, it's not a big hassle. So for right now, this main campaign setup window, I'm going to close that. And I'll just say yes for right now. And this is basically our um, custom theme for the Founders Day Festival. It's built on top of the classic theme. But it's pretty nice looking. Um, all of this stuff here in the chat window... I can clear all that, so I'm going to go right-click, hit clear. And Thank you. I am also going to unlock it. So you just click on this little padlock uh, location after I right-click on it. And I can stretch this out and kind of shrink it a little. And I'm going to pull this down. That way it's much more easier to see the combat tracker, which I will pull up now. So the combat tracker is going into place. And as you can see, it kind of overlaps a little bit. Um, these are based on some concepts that Digital Dave had originally put out in his early days of streaming. And those were some of the best bits of advice that I'd ever followed or listened to. So here on the bottom, I'm going to right click and lock this now so the window doesn't move. And now I'm going to set up a few other things to make sure this desktop is ready to go. So I'm gonna go into the options now. Now I'm not gonna have time to explain what all these different options do, but I'm gonna show you some of the things that I'm going to mess around with. So first of all, I wanna enable the dice tower so that I can see it. So it has a dependency, which is basically this table dice tower needs to be on. And if you only do that, only the players can see it. So I'm also going to click on Chat Show GM Rolls. Once I do that, the dice tower will appear on the bottom right corner. I'm going to right-click, unlock it, drag this over to the um, dice area so it's close. And then I'm going to right-click and lock it. So this is so that it's easier and everything's in one area. Another thing I'm going to do is take this down arrow, which is next actor, and I'm going to put that in my hotkeys. That way I got everything real close to each other. So the next thing I can do is usually when I'm doing a game or something like that, I don't use the logo or the decal because I think it's distracting and sometimes it gives away the, the module. I mean, you'll see a picture of, you know, you're running, uh, let's say for instance, uh, Curse of Strahd and here you got this big vampire on there. Well, I don't want him to see that just yet. It kind of ruins the surprise. So. I'm going to go ahead and click here, and you can turn that off. 
or you can change it. This just happens to be our Founders Day logo. Normally, though, when I'm running a game, I don't have any logo on. Um, the other thing you can do is decide if you want to share the inventory section on the party sheet, which is right here. It's in this upper right corner. You can share the inventory sheet, this one, with your party. And also the uh, party watch order and the marching formation. Normally, I don't have a problem with this, so I will turn that on for my players. But the other one that I sometimes will show them is this one. And I don't leave it on all the time. When we're doing marketing, you know, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, market day, um, or we're doing a store transaction, anything like that, then I will open it up and share it with them. Normally I don't do that because I don't need them studying everybody's inventory and that, that, that's, that's way beyond what needs to happen. That's a little bit of metagaming. Now I don't care if they see it, but you know if I leave that open, people get bored, they just start clicking around and looking at stuff they shouldn't be poking in. So I'll usually shut that off when we're done doing store transactions. So the next thing I'm going to do is put this down here. And when you start placing your windows, you want to kind of leave them where you want them to appear. So the party sheet, I'm going to leave it here. And when I need to dismiss it, or if I need that space down here, instead of moving it out of the way and closing it and all that stuff, you just dismiss it from up here. So in other words, a button up here, if you click on it, it goes away. Click on it, it comes back. Same thing with the combat tracker. If you can dismiss it or bring it back. So if you need that space temporarily, that's a handy way to do it without reordering all your windows around. The next thing is this add auto NPC initiative. So what this does is it changes the way the combat tracker puts the initiative in the combat tracker per group or per individual, or you can turn it off. So if you have it on group, when you add NPCs, they will all have the same initiative. If you turn it to off, you have to roll manually. And if you put it on on, it will roll for each per combatant that you put on the combat tracker. So I happen to like that because that way it's not big mobs of people going at the same time. It gets boring. It's okay if you're a new DM and just brand new to you. But once you get familiar with Fantasy Grounds, you don't need that sort of help, usually. Um, also, NPC roles, variable or fixed. So on the NPC sheet, when you have something loaded, which I don't, your NPCs will have a, a fixed number and it'll have a roll for damage. So if you use the fixed number, it'll always do the same damage every time. If you do the variable, which is the standard default, it will roll according to the roll. So that may be good at a, in a first level game where you know that after three hits, your characters are gonna die. So it may be a good way for you to control the amount of damage or to predict it so you don't have to um, unfortunately give them a wild swing in which the the monster might do max damage or something like that. So definitely uh, consider that, maybe using that at first level. Um, the, uh, the rest in peace thing that I loaded earlier, I have that on the token for DMs and players. So that's what makes the little tombstone. If I didn't have that extension, th these two options wouldn't be here. The next thing is turn, skip, hidden actor. I turn that on. So if you have combatants on the combat tracker and they are basically not, they're not showing themselves on the map yet. They're still invisible. I have that on so that the combat tracker skips over them. And the only other thing I mess with is, let's see, uh, the attack, critical, and fumble tables. If you want to use that, you can turn that on. But you have to have a table module loaded as well. Um, auto death saves is automatically on. I recommend that, especially if you're new. Um, some players like to roll their own death saves. 
In most cases, they're on their phone or not paying attention anyway, so I just leave that on. Um, NPC hit point status, or hit points. Combat tracker, this adds the standard roll off of the stat block. I would basically change it to random. That way the NPCs don't have the same hit points when you add them to the combat tracker. And the only other thing I mess with is this map diagonal distance. So what that does for variant is instead of going 45 feet diagonally, you will only go 30. And most um, characters can only move roughly 30 feet per round. So roughly um, what this does is it cuts out that extra 15 feet. It'll count every other square as 10 feet. And it cuts off the Pythagorean theorem here. So if you know a triangle is the two um, opposite sides, uh, one and a half times equals the length of the longest side. So that's why you get 45 feet instead of 30 if you leave the standard on. So learn your hypotenuse. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Oh, one other cool function that was programmed into this theme is you can put the campaign name here, which in this case is Founders Day Weekend, and then you can put the session number. So what happens is up here, instead of saying Combat Tracker, it'll actually put the, the session name in here. If you want to add additional languages to your campaign, you can come to Languages here, and you can add them. So you, there's Undercommon, Dwarvish, you know, Giant, these things. I'm going to go ahead and add Druidic and Thieves Cant. So right now, they're really not even a language, but I thought it'd be kind of cool. So basically, these are languages that are basically exclusive to rogues and to um, druids. And I'm not really going to assign necessarily anything particular, but for rogues, since I don't have a lot of choices, I'm just going to use Draconic. And for the Druidic, I'm going to use the Elvish font or Celestial and eh, Primordial. So that's that. And if you need to change your currency, perhaps you're traveling in a city where they have their own coin names. You can change these or add your own currencies if you like. This is kind of a new feature, pretty cool. So that's pretty much all the settings that I'm gonna mess around with for this particular setup. Now, if you wanna know more about these settings and what they do and why mess with them and change them around, um, Rob and I and the community have done two separate uh, shows on the All Things Fantasy Ground show, which we have linked as a playlist on our YouTube channel, which has up to 76 episodes now. So I advise you go watch those if you really want to know what everything does here. Okay, so enough of that. Now I'm going to consider loading up some books from my library. Uh, changing the color of my dice, which I kind of like the color now. Um, also, I might change the mood lighting, depending on the time of day it is, or the uh, vision problems I might be having. Um, let's see. Oh, the calendar. So this calendar is very useful, and I doubt very many people use it. So i got to hit modules, and I'm going to search for it. This module comes with Fantasy Grounds, and I know that if you know what you're doing with Fantasy Grounds, you can create your own calendar. I've seen people do it. So I'm doing a search for calendar. There it is. It's a built-in module. When you activate it, you get your calendars from different settings. So there are several settings here. You have Greyhawk, Eberron, Ravenloft, Dark Sun, things like that. You can use the regular Gregorian calendar. I'm going to use the calendar of Harptos, which is what is basically prevalent in the Forgotten Realms. So now I have this set up here. Now I can start 
planning what what I want to do in game time. So this isn't real life uh, tracking necessarily. This would be what's happening in the game. So I think my campaign is going to start in spring. So green grass is the month of spring. It's basically the first and it goes all the way to the 10th. So basically this is the, the week of green grass is the first through the 10th. And every day they have a big party in a lot of the different cities throughout the realms. So I'm going to start in spring just to have a starting point. And I'm going to change the era. So this would be like AD, BC. So this is Dale Reckoning, DR. And I know the last uh, product I looked at was 1488 for the year. Give or take a, a year. And then I want to change the time of day. So from here, the time of day might be, um, you know, uh, not 5 in the morning. But let's go with 10 in the morning. You do is you click on here and you roll your, your mouse wheel forward or backward to advance the time. So I go to 10.30. And that basically sets the clock to whatever game time you want to start. That's if you're tracking time. And then I'm going to hit this arrow, which sets the time, the calendar, but you have to pick a day to start. So I'll do the day before spring. So green grass is here. So let's see. I'm going to go with chess, and I'm going to go with this 30th day. So this is the day before the day before. So this will be a starting point. Ghosts of Salt Marsh, and then we'll just put uh, session zero, I guess. Right there. Now that I have that set, if I double click on there, I can make another entry if I want. I'm going to go ahead and set the calendar now. And now it says it's the 10th day, 30th of Myrtle, the year and the era and the time. So if I click here, that sets the, the calendar day. If I click here, that sets the time. So I'm going to open up my notes pad. Now, it's recommended that you either use a notepad or a story entry. If you want this to stay and you want to export it later, you want to use a story entry. If you don't care and you're just going to run it for one session, then go ahead and, and use uh, the notes. For the class, though, or for this session, I'm just going to use the notes. And I'm going to go ahead and um, click this edit button. And I'm going to click the plus button. And I'm going to click, this is session zero. And we'll call it Salt Marsh. So I'm also going to drag this down to the hotkey. I'm pretty much going to run most of the stuff right out of the notes. And then, since I have you here, you can also set the moon uh, phase. So, you click on the moon here, and you can set up different moons. So, I'm going to click the edit button, click this plus button, and the moon is Saloon. So the moon is basically Saloon, and you can pick well, you know, the period and the shift in it. So I'll do one shift, and it'll be a 30-day moon. So once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and exit out. And then here's the moon name. So now it shows the phase of the moon here. So right now it is... You can't see the moon, but it's like a, a, a new moon. 
And as the calendar progresses, which I'll show you, the moon will change phase. So I'm going to go to the time thing and speed up time to go to the first day of um, Kythorn. So let's see. Yeah, so it's going to go through here and it will advance the moon cycles. So as I advance and it changes to the next day, if you watch that moon cycle where it says Saloon, it will advance the different phases of the moon. So now it's a crescent. And as the month goes on, the shape of that moon will change according to what time of the year and what month that you're in. See, now it's kind of a half moon and it's already got about, you know, about a week or half a week out. So it, it keeps the track of the cycle. Then if you click this, I believe it will, yeah, it doesn't do the, uh, the mark here, but it does still give you all the notes. It gives you an idea what phase the moon is, basically. So if I click on here, this is the half moon, and you put a date there if that's your next adventure start date. So this is how you use the calendar partially. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these dates and I'm going to drag them up into this note area. So this is the start of our adventure day and the time. And we knew that the moon was basically like a, you can't see it, but you can note like the phase of the moon if that was important to your campaign. I know in uh, Dragonlance this would be very useful. So is there any question? Okay. I just changed my thing and I'm clicking the wrong button. Um, no, no questions right now. Just people are just watching what you're doing and and I've never seen that moon thing before. That's Okay. So basically this is uh, a way you can track the moon if you needed to in some setting or maybe there's a, a ritual that you need to perform. Whatever it is, that's kind of a cool handy way to do that. Another thing is um, I'm going to start adding my players to the table when as they build their characters. So to make that simpler, I'm going to go to this library and I'm going to go to the modules. And I'm going to start loading up some stuff that goes with the setting. So I think the first thing I'm going to load is definitely the player's handbook. And I'll probably do the Sword Coast Adventures guide since the setting takes place there and it has a nice map in there. And Ghost of Salt Marsh Player's Guide, I'll load that for my players. Now, I also have a book that I got on the DMs Killed called The Drifters Game Workshop, and it's called Captains and Cannons. It's a player's guide. It has a lot of cool stuff that, that has that's related to ships and sailing and such. And then I'm going to load the player's handbook. And anything related to pirates or oceanic adventures, I'll probably load those. So I'm going to load Volo's Guide to Monsters. Let's see. I'm going to go with Pirates. So, Pirate Adventures. And there is a, a map that you can use. Uh, this is by Jonathan Roberts. Uh, I'm going to use Chris's actually, the ship starter maps. What about the shock plus? Oh, yeah. You should have it as a module. I made a module of it. Yeah, so the I underwater module that uh, Lady Shell and I are working on, I'm going to load that. That has some underwater hybrids. 
Oh, you're putting everybody in there. Wobbin Duke said, what about encounters on the Savage Sea? Yes. I was getting to that. Okay, encounters in the Savage Seas. Got all three of them. So that's a lot of assets that I already have that I've loaded that can potentially help me uh, with this campaign. And I'm gonna load the, uh, there's a coastal town thing. I might do that, we'll see. Being that this is salt marsh. Okay. All right, so that's a pretty good material there, I think. And I'm gonna load my pre-gen module. So FGC pregens, yay! And I think I'm gonna load the monster manual. That would be helpful. And I'm gonna load Cobalt Press stuff. They have some good monster. Books. Creature Codex. So Cobalt Press, I just filtered by author. So yes, Creature Codex. And the Tome of Horrors. Or Tome of Beasts, excuse me. Tome of Horrors is pretty cool too, though. Yeah, it is. Uh, I've got so many different rule sets in my mind. Um, also, there are some really cool third-party NPC books. So I'm going to go ahead and load some of those because I remember they had pirates and stuff like that in there that are already made. So I'm going to check those out. Okay, so we have these epic characters. Um, Rob's pregens, in case you need any. And there's a ton of them. And then there's all kinds of uh, different um, creatures and NPCs and stuff that'll make your life easier when you're setting up. So this would be stuff I would do before anyone connects to the table. So all this stuff I'm doing now is all just prep. And then I wanted to grab some of those encounter. Um, they're basically already created creatures. So Nord Games puts out a really cool one. And it's called Ultimate NPC Skull Dudgery. So it has a whole bunch of like rogues and pirate type of individuals and then there's a few others that I got on the DM skilled that might be very useful like for instance let's see adaptable NPCs that's a really good one and let's see what else there's a whole bunch of different varieties that you can get on the DM skill that really makes this uh, much easier and simpler for somebody. Uh, I'm going to load the Captains and Cannons DM's book. Character options. There's different classes. Conquering heroes, maybe. Oh, the Comprehensive Equipment Manual. Definitely going to load that. Um, the Diablo Bob's module with Rob Tui, I'm going to load those two in case. And Salt Marsh, of course. Sure hope uh, Fancy Grounds isn't going to crash on you with all the stuff. You I know. 
This is something you don't do during the game. Okay, so... I think we're good. I don't think I need too many more assets. I think that's plenty to work from. I also would like you to explain how you do your session zero because I believe that you have people come in at different times to make their characters, not everybody all at once, and I'd like your thoughts on how, how you manage that. Okay, so basically at this point, now they have all the source books loaded, I would invite each player separately to the table and have them either create a character, which I would go through that process with them, just like we do in our classes, or I would have them pick a pre-gen and go over it with them. So it depends on the setting and if it's a one-shot or maybe it's a, uh, you know, a campaign. Generally, one-shots, you don't get too much pre-time. It's just grab a character and go. But if you do have that time, it's nice to go over the characters with them and kind of show them what direction you were heading when those were made. Uh, the other thing is uh, making sure that your player's schedule is, is lining up with your game schedule. And keeping track of who's who in the beginning might be a little challenging because you don't know people's voices yet. You don't know their real names versus their character versus their Discord name. All those things you should probably record in session zero. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pick some pre-gens out. So I'm gonna load up the uh, pre-gens in the library. And I'm also gonna click all. So I get all the banners over here. And I'm gonna go down to my pre-gen module. And there it is. And basically this module I kind of made this for the community. This isn't really something I was trying to sell. And all these characters are based off of characters that I've played in my past. So they're all coded. They're all ready to go. And you can use the reference manual to preview them so you don't have to load them up first. And I just kind of included some pre-gen stories. Uh, kind of the impetus of how to use it and why why I came up with it. And then it has, you know, certain things that, you know, may or may not be useful for to, to you. But nonetheless, um, I'm going to add these. And the only place you can add pregens normally is from the pregen character selection area. And then this map area kind of just shows, you know, how to use it. Um... Here's like the cover I made for it. I just gave the credits to the people who made the maps and the tokens. And I just put dragon not included because that doesn't come with the set. And then I made this for my players so that they can see the characters in action. And if I right click on here and share this with them or preload it. So preloading is just clicking on this image, sharing the sheet and then um, click share sheet or you can do the preload where you sh do the preload image so when they load up from the table this is loading in the background so you can share this photo with them now these pins are not shareable but if there's any characters that they want to look at i can right click on the pin and make the link shareable and it turns it green so that way they can look at it and decide which one they want to pick so it's kind of why I did this. And this one says demon not included. Okay, so that's that. So now I'm going to add them to the campaign. So pre-gen characters. And I'm just going to add a majority of these. I'm not sure which ones we're going to use. All right, so over here it tells you they've been added. So now when your players connect to your table, they can claim these characters here. So basically, um, regardless of who they choose, let's just say um, Lord Galamar is a paladin. 
Uh, Leyron is a half elf ranger. We have uh, Zamas, a barbarian. Zela, true song. We have Squire Valius, who kind of comes with uh, Lord Galamar. Uh, Namita. And Tristal Relk. And we also have a burglar. His name is Figgin. And also we have Doric Weirdbeard Rockfist. He's a healer. That's a pretty big party. So normally I wouldn't recommend having this many players on the combat tracker. But it is kind of cool to see them all there. So what I'm going to do now is add these characters, the ones that are going to play, to this list. So I'm going to drag over. So out of all these characters, the only ones that are going to play is Namita. Um, we're going to use, let's see, Zela, uh, Lord Galamar, Zamas, and I think I'm missing one. Oh, the Spellcaster, yes. So let me grab her in a sec here. So Dorig is a healer. And I forgot to grab the spellcaster. So back to the library. And I'm gonna go to the three gens. And let's see. There's Shayra. So Shayra is a storm sorceress. So now she should be available in the pack. Yep. Okay. So she's going to be a part of this group. Okay, there's six players. So the ones I don't want to use or are not going to use, I'm just going to make their faction change. So I don't have to, let's see. So I don't have to come back here and individually delete them all. So Tristel's not in here. I think that's pretty much everyone. Let's see, Namita. One, two, yep. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit menu, delete from tracker, all non-friendlies. So these are the, this is the party right here. So if Lady Shell was going to play, she's played Zayla before. So I'd probably put her name here and then her email address. And I have everybody added on here. So I remember who's who and it's organized. Now I'm going to lock this for right now. But before I do, I want to link this calendar uh, day to this. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this 30th day here. So you come over to view log entry. And if you have any log entries, they'll be in here. So this is our session zero. So I'm going to go ahead and drag this over. And that would be a link to this. And then in this area, I'm going to link my session notes. Now this stuff isn't necessary, but it kind of makes it so where it's easier to find stuff. Then I'm going to lock it, and it's already shortcut down here on the hotkeys. So I want to close that and close this. Now I am going to close the calendar for right now and I'm going to start setting up the salt marsh campaign. So the first thing I want to do is check out the story. 
I'm going to look at some maps and images. And then I want to take a look at the, uh, the other items that come with it. So the NPCs. I want to look at the items that are included. Uh, the parcels. And the other thing would be the encounters. And then if there's any random tables, I want to check those out. And also, I want to look at the quest items. So these are all the things that make up a module or a campaign setting. Not always, but usually this is what you get. And now I'm going to filter this out. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at this. It's a mini robot. <laughs> mini robot there's a uh, skull dudgery here's the NPCs for Saltmar so this is all the NPCs that come with the module it's quite a bit and then any encounters then there's some tables let's see there's some player tables Cool. Quest items. Looks like it doesn't have any. So we might make something. Story entry. Definitely want to start here. Maps and images. So here's some artwork from Ghost of Salt Marsh. any specific items oh yeah there's that and then of course treasure and parcels okay so basically these are all the different groups that I'm gonna look at before I start the adventure before session one at least um, so you have an introduction here kind of gives you an idea of how the overview of the module goes. So I definitely take a look at this. So I'm going to bring up my notes. And I'm going to go ahead and bookmark that oops So these are going to be my research topics. Um, kind of tells you how to use the book. Um, also, it says that it would be a re really good side adventure for some ongoing campaigns, such as like Waterdeep Dragon Heist, things like that. Or it can also be perfectly combined with Tales from the Awning Portals. So this is kind of cool. And then... Running the adventures kind of tells you how to run this thing, if, especially if you've never done it before. And then you have your credits. So there's the intro. I'm definitely going to study that. And I'm going to go to the next section here. Which is Chapter 1. So this talks about Salt Marsh proper. So I might want to keep that in mind. And then you have an image of the characters arriving into town. So that might be something you want to share with your with your party. So I will put that here. 
before I drag it over, I'm going to unlock it and I'm going to give it a title. So that's just what I'm going to call that. And I'm going to go ahead and click the ID so that they don't they don't need to see chapter 1. They already know it's probably chapter 1. And I'm going to put that over here. So that way I kind of know what what this pertains to. And yes, yeah, so I'm going to do some research here. And then there's some politics and factions. So definitely want to check that out. Here's the one of the factions, the traditionalists. The loyalists. So loyal to the crown. The Scarlet Brotherhood. And just an overview of Salt Marsh. This talks about the economy and the commerce, so I'd probably definitely want to look at that because this can make it to where you can actually um, kind of run things in between your adventures. And then you get an idea of what the economy is like. Uh, the Militia, Law and Order. And the Docks. Okay, so you got a lot of things to look at. You don't have to read every single bit of it. But the more of this that you're familiar with, the easier it's going to be for you to make stuff up on the spot. And also to make sure that you know your players are engaged even before the actual adventure takes place so this is the thing I want to really study and kind of get into more than just the, the overall module so then you have a map of salt marsh which is a pretty cool map and I will go ahead and put that on my cheat sheet here The player map, I might open that up and share it ahead of time. So if I right click on the map and click, let's see, clicking, sharing, and preload image. So I'd probably preload that one since it's pretty big. But I don't need to bookmark that. That'll come up when I need it. But I will put it on my cheat sheet here. Actually, I will bookmark it. It'll be easier. This is where it's good to have two screens, huh? Yes, exactly. And then here's the city gate. So this is basically where they're going to start. That image that was from earlier, the picture, that's like the city gate. So I think I would probably put those together. Kind of makes sense. So I'm going to unlock this and just add it. Okay, so it's right here, the garrison gate. There's the picture. That simple. I think they should have put it there in the module instead of way in the beginning or something. But that's just me. Okay, so the next thing is... Okay, now it's starting to detail all the stuff in town here. So I will do that probably in after session zero or session one. I would get more familiar with all the individual buildings. But for right now, I just want to pay attention to some of these different aspects of the setting itself. So I'm going to close this. I kind of have an idea of what, what's going on now a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and close this. 
And I'm going to shut down all these things here. Because I have my cheat sheet here. So again, if you want to keep this and you don't want it to, to, to go away and you want to load this next time you play, anything that you make uh, in a story entry will save. If it's in this notepad thing, it will not save. So make sure that you put it in a story entry if you want to keep it. All right. So one other thing I want to do is in the uh, Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Let's go with the maps. And I want to... Sword Coast Adventures Guide, Player's Guide. Let's see. Nope. Okay, I need to load the module because I forgot the Dungeon Masters or the regular module. There we go. So now what I'm doing here is Here's the campaign guide. And if you're playing in the uh, Sword Coast area, you have um, all these extra maps that you can draw upon. So these maps will come in handy. Wow, that's a huge map. So you can figure out whereabouts you want to put this adventure. It gives you some suggestions. So like here's Daggerford. That might be a good area because it's kind of swampy and marshy. You have, uh, let's see, where is that at? Um, let's see. So anywhere you want to put it in the coastline would be great. All right, so here's Waterdeep and Neverwinter. So they recommend, if you're playing in the setting, to put it in the dead of the Mare of the Dead Men. So what I would do, if that was the case, if I was going to actually run this as a Sword Coast adventure and I wanted to put it in my campaign setting, I think any of those two places would work pretty well. This is a suggested area. The other one is, you know, an additional option. So, I think I'm going to link the uh, story entries to here and my notes. So here's Salt Marsh. So I can't really do much to this because it is um, copyright protected. So I'm just going to put a pin here. And that'll be the salt marsh um, pin. And then for this, if I want to blow up the map or something like that, I can have that pin there. If I need to use that map later, to show the party members, I can do that. Now I'm going to put that in my cheat sheet too. So that's all that stuff. So that's quite a bit of research and reading that I might get into before I do session one. But if you know the factions and the law and order and the you know what's going on with the districts and the main players in town, you can actually make your own little sub-quest before the adventure starts. So that would be a good opportunity to do Session Zero. So I'm going to do that. So in this case, I want to research the Scarlet Brotherhood.
So they have all these NPCs in here. And you got some stat blocks. So you can go through these and figure out who these people are and what they represent. So they basically are opportunistic. They try to cause disruption. And they want to turn the town into its favor and put in Anders as the most prominent member. So this is, could be an issue. So they do all kinds of things to kind of wreck the town's peace. So that would be one way to, to get people uh, excited about adventuring in Saltmarsh. Or maybe they're working for the king on the mainland. So if that's the case, then you might want to research the uh, um, loyalists. Maybe some of your party members are part of this loyalist faction, or they can identify them with at least. And then also there's the old school traditionalists. These are the people who've lived around the area for many years, and they've seen the people come and go. And I think they'd be more attuned to the nature and to the uh, region itself. And they would, you know, they would probably understand the weather better and all the superstitions and the local color and lore of the town. So this is definitely, uh, if you can identify with some hardy townsfolk and things like that, I think that this would be a good thing to look at too. So if you're going to be in the traditionalist faction, you have these events that would basically could set up uh, an inter introduction. Um, whatever it takes to get the people into the party, into the into the game itself. So I'm going to go ahead and roll on this table, and I'm going to make a kind of like an event that would lead up to this adventure. So I'm assuming you already kind of know the adventure and what happens and how it works. Uh, you get the mood of the town. You, know, you get all those things under your belt, you'll get a pretty good idea of what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and roll this. And that's 12. So a fire breaks out in town. Um, Etta Olin raises funds to support those who lost their homes. So when you arrive to uh, Saltmarsh, perhaps you've come on a boat instead of on the mainland. And uh, that's where we're going to start. So most people traditionally start on land. I think that our party got a ride up the Sword Coast and they're getting dropped off near Salt Marsh. So they're gonna stop there um, and anchor and take a small boat into Salt Marsh to see what's going on. Maybe get some supplies. Maybe they saw the fire from the on the horizon and decided to go investigate to see what it was. Whatever it may have been, that could very well be a segue into this adventure, uh, the, the campaign itself. So I think that'd be a good idea for a session zero. They, they disembark the boat, they get off on land, uh, they take a little boat and they end up going into the salt marsh area and finding out that there was a fire that had just recently been put out. Maybe they even get there in time to put out the end of the fire. So that's something that you could do to potentially enhance this adventure and not make it so generic. Now the other thing is, in this library, I've loaded a lot of other things that you could potentially use. So for instance, this Pirate Adventures. It has additional backgrounds, feats. It has some um, picture of, of pirate related things. So that may be something you want to use. Um, is some adventuring gear. You have the roles of a ship. So maybe each one of these characters, minus captain or something, might have a role aboard one of the ships. So you have a master gunner, a boatswain, a pilot, quartermaster, and a, camp a captain. So that could be some things you might want to roll into your, your ship. So speaking of ships, I want to find a couple. So I'm gonna go into the maps and images section and I'm gonna create my own category because this is just gonna be for the campaign. 
So I'm going to click the edit button, click the plus button, and it'll always default as group one. So I'm just going to do this Ghost of Salt Marsh thing, a GOS campaign custom, so I remember the the actual um, section. And then anything I want to use image-wise, I could drag them into this, this uh, area. So if I didn't have a picture of a city guard, I have one here. Um... Let's say you're going to a tavern or an inn. Here's some coins. Let's see. Here's another map. So if you wanted to use this, instead of the other map, you could. This is actually looks more like a a player map than than a actual campaign map so this might be something you want to use maybe they find a treasure chest and it has the map of the sword coast on there with some pins so i'm gonna definitely think about using that yeah so custom map interesting yeah it is and then there's some city maps that you might want to use if you got a nearby city um, other than salt marsh it's more of a town and then you have all these different symbols so if there's a god or goddess that's worshipped in the town of salt marsh if there's a symbol here you might be able to use that uh, another thing you could do is these tokens here um, Right now, I have, let's see, I have this big folder full of these oceanic, oceanic based tokens and swamp. And then I also have these uh, little markers. So these are heraldry signs for pirate ships. Um, there are some spell tokens in here that have to do with water and tentacles. I have some parrots in here. I have some pirate looking NPCs. I have um, aquatic based animals and salt salt marsh based animals. I uh, have got a question? Sure. Okay, Drek wants to know when you take them out of that location and put them into your new group, are they missing from the old location? Yes. And that's okay because I want them where I want them. And if it breaks the link, I can just link it right right where the broken link is. And it doesn't change the module. It just changes the session. So you can always go back and revert. So if you didn't like what you did and you got the module all screwed up, you can go to Salt Marsh here and right-click on it. Or in this case, this would have been Sword Coast Adventures Guide. You right-click on it and you would click Revert in the modules area. And everything will go back to where it was. So let's go to Sword Coast. So Sword Coast Adventures Guide right here. If I right click on it and click revert changes, all of those things I drag around will go back where they belong. So it's really not going to break anything. The only thing that might break is if you try to o open a story entry and which sometimes they're locked anyways. But if they're not and the link is in a different category, it might break that link. But that's the only thing that I would really concern myself with. I kind of like to have objects where I want them to be as opposed to organize the way they want it. That way I can find it. It's all in one spot. I don't have to dig around in 50,000 windows. Because then I can just run the campaign out of my notes now the other thing is you might want to use one of these 
tokens as your party token. Or if you need a token for one of your players, there might be something in here that would be useful. Because there's a lot of seafaring, you know, themed uh, characters in here that might work. And you have Hydras in here. Um, you have the Sahu again. There's different varieties of those. And there's all kinds of tokens that are themed for this particular setting. I got some slaves in here. A giant sea turtle, some drakes, some whales, skeletons, uh, you name it. I went through a whole bunch of token packs and pulled these over just in case. There's also sharks and manta rays and stuff like that. So let me think. So this is the story element that I'm going to keep. So there's a fire breaking out. I'm going to use that one for my session zero. So I'm going to put that in here as a note. I'd like to suggest something for your sure. uh, storyline. Would be, how about players want to help, um, like there's a family that lost their house in the fire and the players want to help raise some money to help them get a new house. I'm not sure how, but uh, that would be my concept. Yeah, so this description says a fire breaks out in town. Um, Etta Oland, one of the traditionalists, funds to support those who lost their homes. So perhaps she talks to you guys and convinces you or helps you uh, fund these people to repair their home. And in doing so, you learn more about the local color and the region through them. So instead of finding out the hard way, they might teach you different things that will help you navigate through the region. I mean, they might know some stuff that you don't. So this would be the, you know, one of the plots that you can use to kind of introduce the characters in. Another thing is I can set up a test combat for the players so that when we do start playing, they are a little bit worked out, so I can check their, make sure their stats are rolling and that the rolls are correct. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create their their starting point. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, grab some images. So like Game Tile Warehouse, for instance. And I'm going to also bring up my custom section. which was G-O-S, right here. Okay, so these are the different maps that come with this set. I'm just gonna use a galley that's out in the water. And this is the top deck here. Let me see if there's any others that might work better. Yeah, that should be pretty good. This is the top of the galley. That'll work. And then I'm going to put a grid on it. So right now, I'm going to right click on here and set the grid. And let's see, this would be roughly about 50 or so. I think 48 looks good. Okay. So there's the grid. And also, I might even add other levels of the ship if I plan on doing any sessions on the boat itself. Maybe there's some mutiny going on, uh, some kind of fighting, inner fighting amongst the ship crew. Whatever it may be, this might be useful. Another is you know, to have this oceanic map in case they want to swim or jump off the ship. You already have something there. So I might use those two, and that's what I'm going to use to start this campaign out. I'm going to go ahead and rename this map, though. This one's not locked, so I can rename it. So this, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to have that visible, but this, this ship is going to be called the SS Lady Shell. 
You always name your Well, that's a steamship, right? Yeah, I don't think that's a steamship. What is a sail ship? I don't know what. Would it be a mo SS motor or vehicle? No, WS. No, SS steamship. WS? Drake, Drake wants a rat plague breaking out on ship. That sounds good. The WS Lady Shell. That's the name of the ship. Now, if you wanted to get fancy about the boat itself, there are a lot of additional rules that you could classify the ship itself. And then you can actually get the stats for the boat. So if you had any naval combat, or let's say you're going to use the map that shows that big kraken, it might give you an idea of how long the ship would last in the battle. So there are other additional rules out there that you can use to deal with your ship. So that might be a thing you want to do anyway, especially if you're going to use the ship more than once. So you're going to want to detail the ship itself. So I know that Salt Marsh and that other pirate uh, accessory has the uh, as captains and cannons. It has some ships. So here are some descriptions of the ships. So this would be a large ship. So it's probably a galley. That's about the closest it is. So let's take a look at the galley. Yeah, so it's just a, a tag here. It gives you some basic stats. And it's the cost. So this is more like a parcel as opposed to a stat block. So this would be kind of good to, for reference. So I'll link that there in case I need it later. But if I wanted to get into the pieces of the ship, then you'd have to get into the actual module for Salt Marsh. So go to Salt Marsh. Go to NPCs. And now you're going to look at this and you're going to say, okay, here's the ballista if you had one. Um, things like that. So you can definitely uh, use this stuff to kind of detail what you're going to be working with. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the actual NPC entries or the, the module itself. Let's go here. And here are the appendants of ships. So you have a long ship. Um, they have a galley. So this is what you would use for your sample galley. So I'm going to drag that over too. That way I don't have to come back here. And if I needed to, to figure something out, I could easily, you know, use this uh, as reference. So this is like the whole crew here. So you can build your own crew and just use that as a template. And that's basically a big encounter with either neutrals or friendlies. And then you'd have, you know, it tells you about the main deck and what all the different things are. So it talks about the lower deck and it gives you a rough idea of how big the ship is. So even though they're quite different, it still gives you an idea of a basic deck plan. So then you have upgrades for hulls and stuff like that. So you wanted to get really detailed with this, you can. So I went ahead and bookmarked those on the boat itself. That way I don't lose the information. And I'm also gonna link this to my cheat sheet here. So it's the WS Lady Shell ship map. That way I know where it's at and I don't lose it. And let's see. At least see. I'm not docked this time. That last one that you put, you had me as docked. Docked. 
doctor. Okay, so here's some encounters here from the encounters on the Savage Seas. So here's the list of them. And here's some random ones. Also, Drake said that um, its sailing vessel is SV. SV, on, actually, okay. The SV Lady Show. Okay. SV, thank you for the correction. So, NPCs, you can use any of these. You got different captains. Uh, this is some pretty cool, already created um, NPCs to help you with your campaign, and they're all themed for oceanic adventures. Um, let's see, you have bandits. You have different. You have different captains: a commoner, a cultist, deckhand. There's already a st stat block for the deckhand. So I'm going to start building my own crew. So this time I'm going to just take another note, I think. Actually, a story entry would be better. Eh. Oh, can't we get Calico Jack from our last one? Wasn't he a tabaxi? Yeah. Calico Jack? Yeah. I don't think he's in this token set, though. Oh, darn. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and just do another note. This will be helpful because I'll use it later. So here's the SV Lady Shell crew. So I'm just going to drag over the, the generic um, stat block, so I have something to work with. So, maybe the one of the captains. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. You can make uh, Calico Jack out of a commoner, can't you? Yep. Or I can make him one of the crew members. So let's do... Okay, I'm going to take one of the captains. Uh, deckhand. Uh, let's see. There's a smith. Or handsmith is the name. Hilda Rottentooth. Hunter Shark. Who is Big Hefty? I'm about to find out. Big Hefty. Or it's Big Hetty. I like Big Hefty okay. better. <laughs> it's a Triton. Funny. Oh, okay. And he's a captain. Well, yeah, he would be Hefty. <laughs> huh. Let's see. Do we have the... Let's see, there's some goblins. Giant shark. Let's grab that. Shocktopus. Oh yeah, the shocktopus. Let's grab that thing. So we got some homebrew going on here. Oh, this doesn't have it in there. Oh well. We'll just use the chubboleth. Oh, the chubboleth? Yeah. Shockpus isn't in your module? Well, it wasn't added it yet. It wasn't added yet. Oh, okay. So this was just exported before we had anything else made. So, um, let's give him a token. He didn't have any token yet. Poor Chubbleth. He already died to the shock. Right after we designed him, poor thing. He, he kept getting, um, crap. <laughs> so, I'm going to find something kind of nasty. Yeah, let's see. Do you have a Kraken um, thing? That might work. Yep, I think you're right. Or actually, the Chupalip looks more like a giant crab, Chol. remember, with the yeah. abolith 
back. Oh, that's the right. Tentacles on the. Yeah, let me see if I got one of those. Um, yeah, the chawl would work. Yeah. That's where we based it off of for the body type. And you can zoom these in now. A long time ago, you weren't able to do that. You guys are so spoiled. Is there the wheel? You remember yeah. the wheel to make it? Yeah, you can right then. click on it and it zooms in so you can see what you're looking at. It wasn't, it, that's a fairly new feature. That's only been out for like six months or so. By the way, when does 3.3.8 come out? Isn't it? Uh, any day now. Really soon? I think yeah, Tuesday. Yeah, this week. Oh, there's our shocktopus we don't get to use. Here's the octopus. Oh, here we go. We'll use the reef pincher. So, reef pincher. Matakari says 3.3.8 is next week, likely. So that'll be our reef uh, pincher uh, creature. So we'll just use that token. That's kind of cool. So now we need to get a shark token. Pretty sure we can do that. Plenty of sharks. It doesn't want to drop. Yes. Okay, so here's a submerged shark, and here's just an open one. I want the submerged one. So that's that guy. The deckhand. Those look like something from Pixbay. They probably are. The sharks. Mm hmm They probably are. Let's see. The deckhand. Just gotta look like somebody that's ready to help out on the ship. Got lots of little pirate looking dudes here. Yeah, I might make it this little guy here. Yeah, why not? Here we go. Here's a little deckhand. And let's do a captain looking guy. Or girl. And yeah, I go for a female captain on the lady show. There we go. And she's female. Okay, so there's our little crew that I'm picking out right now. We'll just use that for for the moment. And then the Chubboleth. Okay. So that's the crew. And I'll pin them here just in case. Now I'm going to make an encounter. And I'm just going to put all the crew members in there. So I'm going to make my own section here. Okay, there's that. Okay. So, I think I'm just going to make a generic crew here. So, here's the captain. And here are the deckhands. Yeah, I might do a dozen of them. Actually, nine is good. So here's the ship crew. So I'll pin that to the deck here. 
And I'm going to change those to neutral. They're not good or evil yet. So that's that. And now I'm going to place them where I would like them to appear on the ship, provided that this is an encounter. So I'm going to go ahead and set this up as if it was. So here's the wheelhouse and the wheel. So I'll put the captain and a couple deckhands up there. So I'm going to drag that over and drop it here. And I'm going to scale the token up a little bit. There we go. And then the deckhands. They look like Oompa Loompas. <laughs> so she's got a whole crew of Oompa Loompas. <laughs> and she probably calls your party the Oompa Loompa captains. Okay. So there's that. And then once they're in position, then you um, probably save your campaign. So in case it crashes on you. That way, all that work isn't going to waste if you have a malfunction. And then, let's see. So that's the ship crew. They're already placed in case. I'm going to move this guy over here. Kind of diversify them a little bit. Let's see, this guy will be up towards the front. Okay. Now the party members, I'll add them to the boat. And they can stand where they are, you know, where they're useful, I guess. Okay, so that's good. Maybe Namita will be up in the crow's nest. So I might just set her here to kind of represent that she's up in the crow's nest. Okay, so basically, um, this is how I would basically set the ship up and then whenever I wanted to use it, everything's right here. I don't have to go looking for everything. The ship crew's here. The uh, encounter is kind of set up. I have the ship linked to my session zero area. And then I'm going to set up a small little combat. And that, that should be good. And then you can test, you know, how good the party does as a team. And you don't really have to get too deep into the plot just yet. I mean, they know they're going to be playing Salt Marsh but they don't necessarily have to arrive the same day that you play. So you can have a day before, which is this calendar day that I set up. And then uh, I'm gonna set up the uh, sharks and the chubboleth. So the chubboleth is kind of a nasty creature. We put him on there, and then some giant sharks, maybe two of them. So they're swimming towards the top. The Chubboleth is probably down deeper in the water. But that's a CR9 encounter, so I don't think that would work too well for a low-level party. But you have the whole ship, and if you have the ship uh, detailed enough, you can have those deckhands man those... Uh, ballista and things that keep the ship safe. So if you wanted to do a really cool encounter, you could have all the deckhands set, up, set around manning the guns and or cannons or whatever. And then you would have your uh, deck crew all ready to go. Uh, maybe add in a couple more fighter types for the crew. And it just all depends on what you want to do. 
So now this encounter, I'm just going to call this Ocean Battle. Don't really have a good title for it just yet. That's a CR9 challenge rating. That's crazy. So the Chevalith is kind of a nasty creature. So, Maybe you can only do one giant shark. Yeah, that's probably why. Why don't we replace it with regular sharks? Probably why. Maybe one. Actually, none at all. Or either that or two sharks. We'll see. Yeah, I'll get rid of the sharks. They're pretty generic. There we go. Now it's a CR4. That's more like it. So CR4 challenge rating. They are um, basically floating out in the ocean on the boat. So I would just put this down here somewhere so I knew what it was. So there we go. So if I wanted to use that encounter, I bring up the ship. Maybe I would use that open water one to illustrate the, the water in case the characters jump in. So I go to maps, here's ocean two. So there's the open ocean. So that I can link that to here. Okay. So that would be set just in case. So when they go in the water, let me put this up front and bring that map up right from this map. And I could put the Chevalith on your head of time if I wanted to. I'm trying to remember, does the Chevalith uh, breathe outside the water, or is that the one that only breathes for an hour outside the water, then it has to go back in? Well, let's find out. Remember. It can breathe air and water. Okay. So this would probably be closer to the coast, which we are. We're heading towards the uh, Sword Coast. Um, it oh, it is gritted. Wow, that thing is big. Mm-hmm. Yep, and let's see. He has telepathy, that mucus cloud thing. He has a multi-attack. Yeah, he's pretty nasty. He's got, he's immune to cold, poison, and piercing. He cannot be prone. He has dark vision. You can feel vibrations. He has a fairly high passive perception. He has ways to communicate. And most of these are for understanding language as opposed to, you know, actually speaking. And then he has some skills here. 15 armor class and 55 hit points. Pretty nasty. Walking Dude says, only CR3? Did we, like, mess that up or something? Maybe he should be higher. He's CR4. Yeah, there could be because we added I'm a few looking, things. I'm looking at the challenge and it looks like it says three, but I mean, I'm back. Maybe I... Ocean Battle Encounter, it's a CR4. No, but I mean, Chubbalip by himself is a CR3. Well, it's not changing the... Oh, yeah, I see that. Well, then so, I don't know. his stat block said... See, it might be three. jacked up. Mm. We can change it. But then you have to re-add them and recalculate.
Yeah, because I think our players would be very disappointed to, to fight no, that thing, kill anything. that thing, and then only get whatever. I can't even see how much It's uh, like 750. That That's it? Between like six people or something? Yeah, and they, yeah. They would be I would good. give them 1250 at least. <laughs> yeah, so that basically would be a way that you could... You know, you definitely would have to balance that creature out a little bit more. But uh, I think that if you um, basically ran the story that you're approaching the Sword Coast, you have this little encounter to test your party out, and they don't have to be a fight to the death. I mean, you could just have them, like, take a couple pop shots at them, maybe let them try to climb up on the ship, maybe someone fireballs a damn thing, catches the ship on fire, and you have to go into shore. I mean, it's, there's all kinds of things you can do. Uh, also, fireball the ship, everybody jumps out, and then the sharks <laughs> get them. Another thing you could do is in the tokens that I, I picked out, I have a couple boats. I'm pretty sure I grabbed some boats. At least two of them. Rowboats. There we go. Um, there we go, there's a small boat. <laughs> there we go. So you can probably put this on here and then just make it a lot bigger to represent where the players are. So make this a lot bigger. Like that or so. Where's the shovel is? <laughs> of course, since we just made this thing, they probably don't know what the heck that is. Yeah, that's true. So this would basically be like a representation of their ship or the boat. And the players might be on the boat. So just go like this. Just say um, a few of them are on the boat. Oh, the old tokens don't want to go mm -hmm. on the other token thing. I hate yep. that. But anyways, you'd have to have the... have uh, Unity to no get doubt. rid of that. Well, you can use the, the uh, that extension, the, the layers extension. Combat a, extension? Yeah, it's a pain in the ass. But anyways, so this could be that. And then for depth, um, I would use this little map over here on the party sheet. for depth. So I'm going to make the water line here. I'll make that the, uh, just a rough idea. So then you could say each one of these squares is 10 feet. Because you're not really using it to, to track you know, how many squares. You're just trying to keep track of roughly the distance. So we'll say the Chubboleth is down here. So this guy is down here. So he's, let's see, 10, 20, 30, 40. It's about 50 feet down, roughly. So that gives you an idea of how far he is from the from the party. And then... Your, your drawing looks more like a jaloper. Jaloper? Yeah, the gelatinous cube and uh, roper. Oh, jaloper. yeah. Yep. There's the oars, you could say. Anyway, so that just gives you an idea of, 
you know, the perception of how far down it is. So you can pop this up, put them on the map somewhere. Yep. So you go ahead and send it to the combat tracker. And there he is. So he's like, you know, 40, 50 feet under the water. So they couldn't even see him at this point. So that would be the, the premise of this encounter. Maybe they're out fishing or maybe they're rescuing somebody that's floating in the water. Um, there could be somebody that um, was shipwrecked and they come across them before they head into salt marsh. Or it could be maybe it's a sea elf or something that comes to their rescue. Whatever it may be, this would be a good map for that. So let's see. It can make another encounter. And I don't know if they have any actual aquatic elves, but I'll find out. I made a sea elf, so I believe they are part of the the um, salt march thing as a. NPC. It's a character though. Or not NPC as a. P yeah. No, no, no. Oh, oh, I see. I need as an NPC. NPC. Yeah, I. Don't. So Oceanus is one, right? Yeah, he's a sea elf. So I could just take this oh, and yeah. and turn it into a sea elf. So I can do that. Kayla Room. Yeah. What on Morningstar wants to know. Let's talk into the mic, Shelly. How will <laughs> getting unity for people that have ultimate? That's a question. How what? How will getting unity for people that have ultimate? How, how do you will get you it? Get, how do you, yeah, if you have ultimate? I guess um, if you have to have uh, done the Kickstarter. Yeah, that, yeah, you'd have to wait till December if you didn't participate in the Kickstarter. And at that point, I think they'll offer a lot of the people out there a uh, some sort of upgrade, which would be a little bit cheaper than just buying it outright. And I think they'd give you a discount. I'm not, I can't say that for sure, but you know, good business practice would say that you know most of the people that already own Fantasy Grounds are probably going to benefit from some sort of discount or some kind of deal. But there hasn't been anything official yet, so don't quote me on that. But you would just pay an upgrade fee um, of some sort. You would keep Fantasy Grounds Classic, and it would give you a whole new key. In which you would unlock the, the the final version, but if you weren't part of the Kickstarter, you'll have to wait till probably early January before you can actually use Unity. But that's kind of beyond the scope of the uh, the uh, adventure or the uh, d the session, anyways. I don't mind answering those, but I don't know the actual a good answer yet. So let's see. Um, so we're going to call this Sea Elf. Might give him a few more hit points. A little bit more dex. A little bit more charisma. I think that's good. So let's see if I can find him a better token. So generally, I wouldn't be as scatterbrained about this. I'd actually have taken all this stuff, wrote it down somewhere, and then look for all my tokens and create all the NPC entries. I wouldn't necessarily be doing it like this. This would take a long time. So it is kind of taking a long time. But if you do this ahead of time, before you play, it'll make life much easier for you. And then you just start linking everything together, almost like you're making your own module. So let me see if I have any elves or anything I can use for him. Eh, weird. That doesn't look right.
Huh. Well, I might just use a token. So let me see. Or a pog. And let's see. Nothing really stands out. I mean, he's a sea elf and I don't have one sea elf in here. That makes no sense. I'm just going to give him this druid uh, costume here. I think that would work. Oh, here we go. This human mage kind of looks like a sea elf, kind of. Yeah, I'll just use this druid. That's some of the trident, maybe. Huh. Hey, there is a trident. What do you know? I can use this as his token. <laughs> Let's try that. There we go. I like that one. So this will be Oceanus's token since I don't have a decent one for him. And then I'm going to change the lighting to kind of a greenish color. And then Oceanus is going to be solo. I'm not going to really make him an, an encounter. That'd be the best way to do it. But I'll put him on the combat tracker by himself. And I'll make him a friendly. And I will drag him onto the combat tracker. Or onto the map. So that'll be Oceanus. So if the party's getting their butts kicked from this Chubboleth, then Oceanus will come in and try to help him out. Plus he can dive down and all that good stuff. So he can assault the creature from below. And the players can try to do what they can on the surface. Now, if the Chubboleth swims over and knocks her boat over, that's going to be a bad thing. Yeah, that Chubboleth is pretty big compared to the boat. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Oh, yeah, he's, he's a monster for sure. Yeah, that'd be one hell of a battle. <laughs> yeah, it looks awesome. It's Godzilla. Yeah, that'd be fun. Actually, that looks like a lot of fun. You got the sea elf that might show up, so I could change his visibility if I put him in an encounter so he's not showing up right away. And then have the Chubboleth show up while the characters are trying to get across this this map here and then once he starts attacking or they they spot him um, he'll he'll try to attack them and then once that happens um, the sea elf can show up if they're doing poorly or if they get knocked out of the boat he'll he'll show up so that's something you could do so i think that's where I'm going to stop it. We've been going for almost two hours now. Um, this is just some ideas so that you guys can basically um, you know, try to come up with some of your own material that, that goes in addition. So that way you know, you're not just playing the regular adventure. You're adding your own stuff. I mean, that's generally what I like to do. Um, I get kind of bored of the cannon stuff, and if you just use the exact same uh, structure every time, you know, pretty much people know the module, so it's not going to really help anybody uh, to run an ad adventure. You want to show them how to set these things up so that you guys can have more fun, be a little bit more creative, be more of a, a creative type instead of a consumer. And you can add or supplement to what you already have. That way you're not, uh, you know, getting bored and burned out. And it makes the replay value of the setting a lot higher. So just something to keep in mind. 
But I like the uh, Chubbolith and the Oceanus, or the Sea Elf and the party members. That would be a fun encounter to run. And it doesn't look too bad. I mean, it looks doable. Um, we could actually make the big ship closer so that they have a chance to swim back. So there's just stuff like that. So uh, some of the things that we featured on here today, uh, we have the links for those. Most of you that are in here already know what that is. But we used the maps were from, and the boat was from uh, Game Tile Warehouse from Chris. Uh, most of you know who he is. And then um, the tokens were a combination of Devon Knight and also I think the character tokens, those were something I commissioned from uh, Bernardo Hasselman. So he's, he's a really good token um, artist. And then last but not least, the setting is a Fantasy Grounds version of the um, Ghost of Saltmarsh setting. So that's kind of what I was playing with. I really didn't even get into the module so much. Uh, I just wanted to set up that Session Zero and have a little fun before we dive into the adventure. So just exploring the setting is, is important that you give your players a chance to be emerged into the setting, get that immersion in there so that they're not just feeling like you plop, dropped them down in the, into town. Uh, I think that it's important that they have that, that uh, investment in the setting. And you know, when you do a lot of your own stuff, you have a lot more control over it. You can make up stuff easier on the fly. You just have to kind of remember names, places, and things. And you can always have a table for that or create that ahead of time. So with that, um, I'll let you guys go. Uh, you guys have fun. I'm always glad to help out the community and also to continue learning about this software myself. And whatever I learn, I try to pass it on to everybody else. So with that being said, I'm going to go and uh, take care, everyone. Thanks for stopping by, people. We will be posting this on our YouTube page after a while tonight. So uh, if you missed any of it or want to watch it again, you can check out there.